Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpa bana chapam Anima di biravritam mayukai Raham mityeva vibhava ye bhava Karanguli na kotpana narayana dasha kritihi. Namaste. We're only going to do one nama today because it's very deep and there's lots of ideas to go over here. So the first thing is the literal meaning of this name is that she created the 10 avatars of Narayana, the Dashavatara, from her 10 toes. Uh, now, <laughs> this brings up the concept of the man blunder again. The Vaishnavas and uh, some others want to assert that the Supreme Godhead has to be a male. And they often identify Vishnu as that male. But there are so many passages in the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam and in the Tripura Sahasra and many other Sri Vidya scriptures that clearly state that Narayan or Vishnu is not supreme. That Devi is above him. Now, at first glance, this seems to be just a preference, just a taste. Huh? Some people like Vishnu, some people like Devi, and you know, the, the Shaktas will always defend Devi, the Vaishnavas will also always defend Vishnu. But there's a reason behind it. Vishnu is form. Narayana is form. Narayana means the sum total of the jivas. He is the form of all of the conditioned beings. So because he's conditioned, he's, he's made up of conditioned consciousness, he cares about the world. Therefore, he cannot be eternal. He cannot be the supreme because form is always made up of some substance, isn't it? Like this body is made up of, of meat and bones and other stuff. <laughs> so, that which has form has substance, and the substance precedes the form. The classic example given is a gold ornament or an earthen pot. A gold ornament is a form, but it's made of gold. So the gold precedes the form. And after that ornament is broken and it goes back into the earth, it will still be gold. Gold is gold. Sometimes it's a rock in the earth, sometimes it's an ornament. And the same is true of a pot. Pot is nothing but clay. So when that clay is formed into a useful shape, then we call it a pot, but it's still nothing but clay. And after the pot is broken, it goes back into the earth and again becomes clay. So any form, whatever form you can imagine, has to be made of something. And that something, that substance, precedes and antecedes the form itself. When that form comes into being at a certain point in time, it's made of the substance. And then when it goes out of being at the end, that substance returns to its source. 
And that source is Shakti. Even if you say, well, uh, Vishnu is pure consciousness. Yeah, he's, he's pure consciousness, that's fine. But if that is the substance of his form, then the pure consciousness is first, primary. Form is secondary. The substance has to be there for the form to exist. The form depends on the substance. Similarly, Vishnu depends on Shakti. And there's another nice passage in the beginning of the uh, Mad, uh, Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Sundari, uh, uh, Tripura Rahasya, excuse me, that Vishnu is residing on the snake, the thousand-headed snake, uh, Anantashesha. So because Vishnu is resting on Anantashesha, it means he's dependent on Anantashesha for his support and protection. But Anantashesha is resting on the Garbhodaka ocean, the causal ocean. So Anantashesh is dependent on the ocean. Now an ocean is made of liquid. And so as any liquid, it has to sit in some kind of a hollow shape, a kunda. Huh? And who is kundalini? <laughs> Shakti. So the kunda, the empty space, which carries things is her most subtle form. See where this is going? So when we say that the 10 incarnations of Narayana come from her toes, her 10 toes, we're not demeaning Narayana. Rather, we're confirming his status as pure consciousness. The same with Vishnu. When we say that the incarnations of Vishnu come from her toes, it means he's pure consciousness. Being a form, having a body made up of pure consciousness, that means he can manipulate pure consciousness, just like our bodies can manipulate other objects made of earth, water, air, fire, and so on. So because he's pure consciousness, his Vishnu Maya can do anything. See, and he does, and he uses this power to maintain the universe. That's his job. <laughs> so who are these 10 incarnations? Well, they're very well known, but I'll just run through the list here uh, in case anybody hasn't heard. Back in the Satya Yuga, there were th four. Matsya Avatar, the fish. Kurma Avatar, the tortoise. Varaha Avatar, the uh, boar incarnation. And Narasingha Avatar. Narasingha is the half man, half lion. He's my fave. <laughs> then... In the Treta Yuga, there was Vamana, Parashuram, and we've already run into Parashurama in the, uh, the epic Yoga Vasishta. Uh, so we know about Ram and, and Parashuram, but Parashuram also shows up in the Tripura Rahasya. Very interesting, as one of the progenitors of the Sri Vidya. And then there's Lord Rama in the Treta Yuga. Then in the Dwapara Yuga, there's Krishna. And some sources say also Balaram. But Krishna and Balaram aren't really so different. They're just about the same individual. So most of the sources say that in the Kali Yuga, the incarnations are Buddha and Kalki. Of course, Kalki hasn't shown up yet. He's not supposed to come until the very end of Kali Yuga, 
which is approximately 427,000 years from now. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> now there are other incarnations that show up here and there. And the main reason why they're not mentioned in the Dashavatara is because they're not pure incarnations of Vishnu. Some of them are mixed incarnations or they're expansions of Shiva or Rudra or like that. So the 10 incarnations of Vishnu are these. Now, that's the literal interpretation. But then there's a more subtle incarnation that these 10 toes represent the five states of consciousness and the five functions of Brahman. The five states of consciousness are, of course, waking, dreaming, sleeping, Turiya, the fourth, and Turiya Tita. <laughs> Turiya Tita, we haven't discussed it very much, but we can say Turiya is the uh, combination or the root of all the three normal states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. But Turiya Tita is pure, unmodified, non-dual of consciousness. What's the difference? When someone attains uh, enlightenment in this life, they're called Jivan Mukta. Jivan Mukta, their state of consciousness is Turiya. Because this is the root state of consciousness, they are aware of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep simultaneously at all times. Actually, they exist at all times. It's just that in most people, the focus changes from one to another. In Turiya, one can see them all very clearly, operating in different centers, in different chakras, and so on. But in Turiya Tita, this means that the body has gone. The prarabdha karma is finished. There's no more karma, no more birth. And the liberated soul then becomes or realizes fully its identity with Brahman. In other words, we are always Brahman. Never was there a time when we were not Brahman, nor will there ever be a time when we are not Brahman, uh -huh. including now. We are Brahman, but in this life, in this conditioned consciousness, we become covered over by the Upadis. Upadis are limiting adjuncts that give the illusion of individuality and personality and so on. And this is how karma operates. Karma operates through the upadis. And these upadis stay with us life after life after life until we do the work, the yoga, the meditation to throw them off. Uh, and when we do, we realize, oh, I've always been Brahman. <laughs> I'm Brahman now and I will always be Brahman. That's self-realization. But in, uh, as long as the prarabdha karma of the body remains active, then one still feels the other states of consciousness. But when that karma is finished, it's all over. <laughs> and one goes back to being nothing but pure, unconditioned awareness. And this is the completion of the path. Now, those are the five states of consciousness. And the five actions of Brahman are creation, maintenance, destruction, blessings, and liberation. So you see there's, there's a, a, a meeting of these five things in Turiyatita. Turiyatita is liberation. Turiya is the blessings. And of course, 
creation, maintenance, and destruction are uh, Jagrat, waking consciousness, the Svapna, or dream consciousness, and the Sushupti, or the deep sleep consciousness. The three modes of material nature, passion, goodness, and ignorance. So <laughs> the ten toes of the goddess of the Shakti uh, become then the whole universe. Oh, and there's another meaning also, because Bhandasura created ten demons he, with a weapon. He had a weapon called Sarvasurastra. Huh? Sarva means all, Asura means demons, and Astra means weapon. So when he saw that he was about to be killed by Lalita, he released this weapon which created these ten demons in other parts of the universe. And these ten demons then had to be killed by the ten incarnations. <laughs> so you see how the, the Vedic narrative, when you include Shakti, uh, when you bring in the uh, maya uh, and treat maya not as an enemy, but as the substance of which form is made, then it brings the whole Vedic narrative into a single unified whole. And this, is the, this shows the insufficiency of the man blunder of thinking that only the male or masculine forms of God matter. Uh, and it's the same, you know, as above, so below. It's the same in this life as, as well. I'm not gonna get into all that right now, but just know that without Shakti, we cannot attain the full self-realization because we, we may have realized the pot, but she is the clay the substance of which it's made. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.